All right. Well, it's good to see all of you here tonight as we begin in the book of Colossians. Uh, we looked at the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians, we could label that book uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because it was all about the body of Christ. And then when we looked at the book of Philippians, it is walking, uh, the church walking uh, through this life as a testimony. And tonight we begin uh, the book of Colossians, which focuses on uh, the head of the church, uh, the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we do that, let me just uh, say uh, to you, many of you probably knew Rena Turner. Rena and Nolan always sat right over there, and uh, she passed away just as this COVID started. She didn't pass with COVID but uh, they were not able to have uh, her memorial service at that time. And um, so it's been several months, but we are doing her memorial service here in the sanctuary on Saturday at 11 o'clock. So uh, uh, be sure and keep them in your prayers. And then tomorrow afternoon, I'll be doing Jackie Tucker's service as well. Jackie was a member of our church and she passed away suddenly at the nursing home. Uh, day before yesterday and uh, Jackie was always here when she was able to be in church she loved this church and always spoke so highly of all of the cards that she received and the visits and uh, she loved her church so please be sure and remember those families during this time when you think about the book of Colossae of course uh, we probably wouldn't even know anything about this uh, little church there in Asia Minor, there in the Roman Empire, had it not been for the Apostle Paul who was in a Roman prison cell. And it was through those experiences that the Holy Spirit of living God moved upon the Apostle Paul. And he penned the books of Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, uh, and those are known as the prison epistles or the prison letters that were written to those various churches. But also those were used and read in some of the other churches. Colossae was later uh, leveled by an earthquake. And so we probably would not know anything much about that had it not been for the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit using him to pin the, the words uh, to this little book. Now... Uh, Ephesus was the leader of that church or the pastor of that church. He had been converted in Ephesus by the apostle Paul. And so uh, this letter comes about because Ephesus had gone to Rome to speak to Paul about some problems that were existing. And uh, one of those problems was, as has been down through the annals of time, that there are always cults out there in the world. There were false religions that uh, it wasn't going to be long once the church began to flourish that uh, Satan reared his ugly head and brought in false doctrines and false teachers within the church. Uh, one of those cultic false uh, teachings was uh, the Gnostics, or, or we call it Gnosticism. Uh, they claimed that they had this supernatural uh, knowledge that other people didn't have. And uh, so one of the branches of Gnosticism was a group known as the Essenes. And so Paul alludes to that in this letter uh, to the uh, Colossian Christians because he wanted them to understand the doctrinal position in chapters 1 and chapters 2 here in the book of Colossians and then chapters 3 and 4 deal with more practical matters. So verses 1 through 14 is an introduction to the book of Colossians. But first of all, I want us tonight to uh, go through some verses. We won't get through all of this outline tonight. But first of all, in verses 1 and 2, we see Paul's passion for people. Paul had a passion for people. In verses 1 and 2, there's the greeting that he always gives. Paul, he says, Paul, when you think of the Apostle Paul, uh, who do you think of? You think of the one who was zealous, who was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. 
He was a Jew, uh, though he was a Roman citizen. Uh, Paul went around persecuting Christians. He went around persecuting those and consenting to the death of Christians before he ever met Christ on the road to Damascus. He was Saul before he met Christ. And of course, uh, his name was changed to Paul. But it was on that Damascus road experience when a voice from heaven thundered out to him to ask him what he was doing. It was there when uh, in those blinded moments in in few days there, as he was led into the city of Damascus, that that salvation experience changed his life forever. And you and I have about a third of the New Testament because of the Apostle Paul's life and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that moved upon him as he penned uh, the many books that we have in the New Testament. Paul, of all of the soul winners that have ever lived, other than the Lord Jesus Christ, probably the Apostle Paul influenced the world more for Christ than anyone has ever done. He spent his life from the moment he got saved, he spent his life being uh, passionate about Christ and the death, the burial the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and sharing the truth of the gospel. So he introduces to the Colossian uh, Christians here, he introduces himself in the very beginning of the very first verse. And then he says, an apostle. Now, uh, we think of... Uh, we, th you know, we think of apostles being followers of Christ, and they are. Uh, disciples of Christ. All of us uh, that know Christ in a personal way, we're all disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, uh, he chose those 12 apostles uh, that um, early on in the very beginning of Jesus's ministry, those apostles would walk with him, talk with Jesus. They would see him perform miracles. They saw all of those things. And they were apostles. Paul, even though he wasn't one of those original 12, he considered himself an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ because he followed Christ passionately with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind. And the most important thing in all of his life was none other than Christ and the preeminence of Christ and who Christ is, who Christ uh, will forever be and the importance of that. So he introduces to this little church that it's Paul, he's doing the greeting here. He's an apostle. He's the one carrying the message, proclaiming about Jesus Christ. And notice the phrase, by the will of God. It was God's will for the Apostle Paul to be called and to be used uh, not only among Jewish brethren, but specifically to the Gentile nation. That was anyone who was not a Jew. And so he says, by the will of God, tonight, every one of us in this building tonight, and those that are listening to this live stream broadcast, let me ask the question tonight, do you know the will of God? Do you know what the will of God is for your life? Because every one of us here this evening, we were created by God uh, for a specific reason. We were created for a specific purpose. And all too often, I think people spend their lives, many people waste their years of life because they never get on board with the will of God. Let me tell you, God has a purpose for every person in this building tonight and everyone who listens to this broadcast. Uh, the will of God is so vitally important. To know the will of God and to do the will of God, to me, is the greatest of life's successes. It's not all of the uh, things that we amass in life. It's not all of the accolades that are poured upon us. It's not all of, of the uh, things that we achieve in life that we would term success, but it's to live and do the will of God and to find your place uh, 
in the kingdom of God to get on board with that and to further the kingdom's glory. So Paul introduces himself, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And notice he includes Timothy here. Timothy, you'll remember, was one of Paul's helpers. He was a young man that Paul had schooled. Paul had mentored him, and Paul was mentoring him. And Timothy was a great help, and he is using Timothy here uh, in this greeting just as he uses himself uh, to say the things that he's going to share with the Colossian Christians. He says, and Timothy our brother. Now notice he uses the term brother there. Uh, we're all brethren here tonight, brethren and sisters in Christ. And he speaks when he uses uh, Timothy, our brother, that Timothy is a co-worker in the kingdom of God. He is a uh, leader. He's a helper. He's someone that will also share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was much uh, useful in the life of the Apostle Paul's ministry. And then verse 2, he says, to the saints, to the saints. He's speaking now about all the Christians. You know, uh, the world looks at Christians, and because they see us in our fleshly bodies, remember, you and I are not perfect yet until we get to heaven someday. We will be out of this fleshly body that is bent toward uh, yielding to temptation and sin and iniquity and all of those kinds of things. But one of these days, we will be in a glorified, perfected body. But we're not there yet. You know, you may be saved, but we're not safe as we walk through this world because Satan and all of his demons out there, those that are in the invisible realm out there, that we see the results of the evil and the wickedness that they um, propagate upon humanity. And we see their perpetuation of continually doing things in this world. But the world looks upon us and they don't see us as saints. But the word saint means to be set apart. It means to be set apart for God. And so if you know Christ in a personal way, uh, you're a saint of God. You're set apart for him and for his kingdom's work. And so he addresses these Christians there in the Colossian church to the saints. And then notice he says, and faithful brethren. That word faithful you know, the Bible says it's required that a steward be found faithful. Now, I look out over our congregation tonight, and I realize that since COVID hit back in February, 1st of March, that things have been so different. I realize that many, many people uh, are staying in, and I understand that fully. I comprehend that. Uh, many of the... Uh, Older people, and by that I mean anybody 50 and over, okay? Uh, but, but many of them, their, their children don't want them to be out and about in crowds. And, and I understand that. Some have health issues and uh, they certainly don't want to compromise their system. But I'm grateful for their faithfulness to be a part of this service tonight because many of them have tuned in to this broadcast as they do every Wednesday night, Sunday morning and Sunday night, faithful. You know, the Bible says it's required that a steward be found faithful. Paul is addressing the church at Colossae. And he says to these Christians, to these saints, these that are set apart to do the will of God, to do the work of God, uh, he calls them faithful brethren. Now, for those of you that are here on Sunday night and Wednesday night, I want to say how much I appreciate your faithfulness to be here. Because it is so difficult for all of us who are being challenged during these particular days of life and how these things will be in the future. But I'm grateful for the faithfulness of God's people, aren't you? Let me tell you, if it were not for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, let me tell you, the world would be in a far worse shape than what it's in. 
And let me tell you, the only thing that is restraining uh, the Lord Jesus from coming and taking uh, us out of the world, which he will do one of these days, but the only thing that's keeping things in check right now is because of the Holy Spirit living within the life of every saint of God uh, who is trying to further the kingdom of God. So in this very introductory first two verses in the greeting, he sets forth to let them know who he is. Many of them know who Paul is. Uh, and so uh, Ephraim, the uh, pastor, the leader, he's gone to Rome. He shares with the apostle Paul the importance of of uh, realizing that false teachers are creeping in and uh, this special group that think they have special knowledge that only they know and that only certain ones have. And so he will address this issue as we go along in this uh, particular book. But in this greeting, he calls out to these saints. He speaks about their faithfulness, faithful brethren. Let me tell you, I think the world is watching tonight. I think the world looks at you and me. I think the world uh, looks and determines and decides um, how faithful we are to what we profess that we say we believe. How faithful are we to the Lord Jesus Christ? I mentioned a few moments ago that there were there were all kinds of false religions in that early period of Christianity. There have been false religions uh, since the beginning of time, since the church has begun for the past 2,000 years. There are all kinds of false religions that are out there. I want to share uh, something that... Um, uh, John Phillips mentions in his commentary on this particular uh, passage in the book of uh, Colossians. He says, equally important here is the word, our Lord Jesus Christ. The cultist at Colossae, this city that we're talking about where these Christians were, had a Christ. But their Christ was not our Christ. Their Christ was some mythical uh, demurge, some intermediary angelic being. Similar, similarly, he says, all of the cults today have a Christ. But in each case, he is not our Lord Jesus Christ. One cult has a Christ who was a polygamist, secretly married to Martha and Mary at the wedding at Cana of Galilee. That is certainly not our Lord Jesus Christ. Another cult has a Christ who is only a God, a Christ who is not God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, but who is, so they say, none other than Michael the archangel. Their Christ did not rise bodily from the grave, but his body was dissolved into gas and that's not our Lord Jesus Christ. And so John Phillips goes on to say this. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God over all. Blessed forevermore. Eternal. Uncreated. Self-existing. Creator of the universe. Our Lord Jesus Christ stepped out of eternity. Into time to be born of the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Ghost, to be both God and man. Our Lord Jesus Christ went about doing good. He spoke infallibly and inerrantly, as no man ever spoke. He walked upon the waves and stilled the storm. He fed the hungry multitudes with the little lad's lunch, and he turned water into wine. He cleansed the leper and healed the sick. He cast out evil spirits and raised the dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ died an atoning death. He was buried. He rose again in triumph and ascended bodily into heaven. He's now seated in glory at the right hand of the majesty on high, where he ministers as our advocate with the Father and as our great high priest. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back 
first to rapture the church and then to rule the world. Praise God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you, you know, Paul would later say that if anybody preach another Jesus other than this Jesus, then they are to be accursed. And so out there in the world today, I look at our young people that leave high school and they go off to various colleges and universities and so many of them are filled with incredible liberalism that they, many of them stray and wander from the foundational fundamental faith on uh, which we stand uh, as the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of those cults in this early day of Christianity, uh, they just believed that, that their God was created and then they created another one under them and another person was created and, and all through those uh, animations they believed. And so you can only understand in this early period of Christianity how vitally important it was for the church at Colossae to understand in a, uh, in a Roman empire, in a city where there was all of this false doctrine that was being uh, created and creating havoc and division in all kinds of schisms, it was so vitally important that Paul addressed this church and bring these doctrinal facts to their attention. So he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, in Christ. And the Christ Paul was speaking about is the one here that John Phillips speaks about. The Christ, God himself, uh, from eternity past, God has no beginning. God has no end. Uh, Jesus, uh, God himself, who came to the earth as the redeemer, uh, the one to bring redemption. He is the one who was born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, he could not be the sinless son of God. He could not have been pure blood, which would take away the sins of the world. And so when Paul is writing to these faithful Christians, it's so vitally important for him to nail down the foundational doctrine of who Jesus Christ is. He is the one who came. He is the one who died. He is the one who shed innocent blood, pure blood, to take away the sins of mankind. He was the one that was buried. He was the one who arose over death, hell, and the grave on that first Sunday morning. He's the one who walked the earth for the next 40 days after that first Easter Sunday, making post-resurrection appearances to his disciples and to his followers so that they would understand in all of the fullness that he was truly who he claimed to be. And for 40 days, Jesus made those resurrection appearances and if you will remember, the disciples were so fearful that it would be Jesus on those appearances to them that they realized who he was. They saw the nail prints in his hand. They saw his spear-riven side. Uh, they saw him in his resurrected body. He ate with them by the seaside. He walked with them. He talked with them. And after 40 days, he ascended back into heaven. The Bible says where he sits uh, at the right hand of the Father, meaning that he had completed uh, the task of redemption for mankind. And he is seated there in the heavenlies. The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. I'm grateful tonight. He prays for us when we don't know how to pray. Aren't you grateful that sometimes you, you just don't know how to pray and 
And I don't know, but you know, if you're like me, there's sometimes you just feel so tired and so stressed and so weary and you feel so inundated with all of the problems of life and all of the discouragements and all of the disappointments. And sometimes you just are silent and you know that God is praying for me when I don't even know how to pray. Now that gives me great comfort tonight, doesn't it, you? But yet, even though he is the transcendent God, he lives within our heart. How does he do that? Through the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus ascended back to heaven, he told those disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. What was the promise? The promise was the Holy Spirit. God the living in our hearts. Once we receive Christ, he immediately is in our heart. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. It's the Holy Spirit uh, that convicts us when we're wrong. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us understand what is right and what is wrong. It's the Holy Spirit that teaches us through the scriptures. And so I'm grateful tonight that the Holy Spirit of God it lives within the human heart of every person who knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in those first two verses, as we've unpacked that, that Paul wants this church to understand, he is the one that is writing. He's writing from a prison cell. If you can only imagine tonight, uh, the discouragement that must be when you are locked away, shackled away, there in a prison cell because you had preached the gospel, the good news, to give everybody an opportunity to receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, not forced upon them, but to preach the truth of the gospel. And that word gospel just means good news. We sing, tell the good news. Ken's led us in that before. Tell the good news. What is the good news? It's the gospel. What is the gospel? It's about the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about him dying for our sins and that his blood covers us. And we stand justified as if we had never sinned. Let me tell you, I'm grateful tonight for that, aren't you? In a world that is so racked with so many problems tonight, that tonight there is a great peace in our hearts that passes all human understanding. I know because the sovereign God of the universe, he's at the helm of the ship tonight. There's absolutely nothing that escapes his gaze. He's not surprised by what's going on in America tonight. Let me tell you, he knows all about it. He knew about it before we ever were created. And I'm so thankful that as he shares the importance here that he speaks of all of these things and how vitally important they are to him. Now, I want to say this before we close here in a few minutes, and we'll pick this up on Sunday night. I don't want to rush through this or be in any hurry about doing this. But Paul's greatest focus in all of life was to point people to Jesus. He realized that with all of his pedigree, with everything about him, about his very being. I mean, you know, he was a smart guy. He was intellectually astute. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest of the teachers. Uh, a Hebrew of the Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, uh, knew all about Judaism and all about the law and all of those kinds of things. But he realized that God loves people more than anything. And, and in the world that you and I are living in, it's very easy for us to get so caught up with all of the menial tasks of life that we fail to remember that we are journeying through this world and this world is not our home. Even though we are American citizens, our citizenship is in heaven. And so what are we to do while we're here? We are to make the best uh, that we can and do the best that we can and give of the best that we can. And that's why I love the way he says to the Colossian Christians 
to our faithful brethren here. They continued to be faithful in the midst of all kinds of hardships, in the midst of all kinds of problems, in the midst of all kinds of challenges that were going on in their lives. And their lives were probably uh, not a whole lot different than ours. They lived in a different day and time. Things were uh, somewhat different because the Roman Empire was a very strong force in their lives and they had great challenges to live under uh, the um, Caesars of the Roman Empire. But in the midst of all of that, as Christianity was growing and flourishing, and as the church was birthed and born, it was important for them some 2,000 years ago from the 12 disciples that Jesus called to the 120, then to 3,000 that were born into the kingdom of heaven on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to where you and I are today. And as I understand it, there are some 2.7 or 8 billion professing Christians in the world today. And I'm grateful that in that 2,000 year span of time, you can see how Christianity has flourished. Let me tell you, Satan has tried to stamp it out at every turn of the road. But I want you to know, uh, heaven and earth will pass away someday. But he said, my word will never pass away. And I'm grateful tonight to know that God loves people more than anything. That ought to be our heart's desire. It ought to be our heart cry that we ought to tell people everywhere we go. That we got the best thing in all the world, and that's Jesus, and that there is no one like him. And Jesus came to give life, and to give life eternally. But he also came to give life abundantly while we're here. And so tonight, as we go through these verses in the book of Colossians, I want to challenge you to read these verses from week to week. We're doing Colossians now on Wednesday night and Sunday nights. And as we go through this little book and to realize how the Holy Spirit of the living God breathed upon this man named Paul. And the Holy Spirit wrote this book through this man called the Apostle Paul. And I'm grateful that in these prison letters... We see how he brings out all of the importance of who Christ is and who the church is. That the church is the body and that Christ is the head of the church. And Colossians is certainly about the preeminence of Christ. It's all about the focus of Christ being the head of the body of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight, as we've looked at Paul's passion. Not only for this church, but Paul's passion for his entire world that he lived in. May that be our heart cry. May that be our focus. May that be our perspective. And may that be our passion as well. God bless you for being here tonight. Would you stand as we pray together? And we'll pick up in verse 3 on Sunday evening. Father, we thank you once again. Uh, for this opportunity to be in your house. As we study the book of Colossians, God, I pray that you would just uh, help us, help it to burn within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Oh God, things that would solidify for each one of us an incredible foundation on which we live life, build life, pursue life. And Father, as we reach out into our world and share Christ with others. Father, thank you for this church. I pray for our children tonight. Thank you for Jenny, for those that are working back there with them. God bless them. I pray for our children for divine protection upon their lives, for their parents. God bless them, be with them, help them as they grow them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. God, put a hedge of protection around their lives. God, for our young people, with uh, over in the uh, youth building and with Alex and the workers that are there. I pray, oh God, for your divine protecting hand upon them as, uh, Father, they go through so many challenging times in their lives. 
pray, oh God, for our school system. I pray for our teachers. I pray for our administration, oh God. I just pray that you would put your protecting angels encamped around about all of these precious kids. And Father, I just pray no evil would come nigh them. And Father, we as a church tonight, just lift them to you. And Father, we pray for them. We love them. And I thank you for this ministry of this church. Thank you for the tithes and the offerings that are given for the provisions that we can reach out into not only of the world through missional endeavors, but Father, here in our own city for all of the many, many things that we're able to do through our school system and through the many, many organizations in this city, Father, that need help in helping others. Father, may we be a blessing. May we be a light in a darkened world. And Father, may we lead others to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen.